little bit. So I need a little bit of audience participation. Is that okay? You with me? All right, so let's, let's start here. Uh, someone help me answer this question. Why did Jesus come? Why did he come? Misty said, set us free. What else? Who else has an answer? Save us. To save us, yeah. Anybody else? What is it, Jimmy? Our atonement, yeah. Show us how to be. Yeah, the right way to live. Yeah, Misty, you already answered once now. You can't, you're the teacher's pet already. All right, one more. Anybody else? Because he loved us, yeah. Wash us from our sins. Yeah, these are all right answers. And, and for me, I just started studying scripture and said, okay, what did, what did, why did Jesus say he came? Why did Jesus say that he came? And so I began to look at in Scripture. Some of these are going to sound very familiar to you. But let's look. There's four different places in Scripture where Jesus says, this is why I came. This was the purpose for me coming. So number one, Jesus says to seek and save the lost. So that's in Luke 19. Seek and save the lost. What else? What else did Jesus say? Number two, he said that he came to be a ransom for many. Jimmy said an atonement, right? The same, same language there. Um, in another place in Luke... He says that he didn't come for the righteous, but he came for the sinner to bring repentance to those who are sick. Those are powerful metaphors. But the fourth one, the fourth place where Jesus talks about the purpose of why he came, he says the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And, and when I saw that, it was a little bit um, surprising. What, what does that mean? It doesn't really seem to belong on that list. And so I started looking throughout Scripture, the New Testament. Where are the places where we see this common denominator of, of food? And Jesus happening at the same time. And for me, I never, don't, it never, I never realized this before, but there's so many powerful stories in Scripture, some of our favorite stories in Scripture that revolve around food and Jesus being in the same place at the same time, and then something powerful happens. And so we're going to look at one of those stories right now. So if you can turn to Luke 5, Luke 5, 27, we're going to read through one of these passages. Um, and as you're turning there, I just want to announce this uh, a prolific discovery uh, for me as I looked at where Jesus and food were in the same place at the same time what I realized is I'm pretty sure that Jesus was a Callahan Amen. so I, I, I mean I don't know it's, it's hard to argue that um, theologically but uh, there seems to be some evidence for that um, Luke 5 27 that joke might have been funnier before all the Callahans started losing weight and slimming down and looking good but <laughs> I saw them arguing over the cake on Wednesday. So, All right, Luke 5, 27. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. Levi is who we refer to as Matthew, the book of Matthew written by the tax collector. Um, it's the same person here. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance." Let's pray. God, we thank you that we get to come together this morning, that you have invited us to your table, and that all of us can, uh, can receive that invitation. But God, that that invitation extends well beyond the people in this room. And I pray that we're able to grasp exactly what you're trying to share with us this morning. And uh, that this word would go out um, and would not return void. I pray you, were, you uh, eliminate the distractions that the enemy would try to... Uh, implement to distract us and to uh, keep us focused and engaged with with scripture and, and what you have for us and we love your name amen so it's officially november and the holiday season is upon us and thanksgiving is coming and christmas is around the corner and we'll get gifts and we'll sit down at some incredible tables of food and get to partake and and hopefully we can all agree that as good as the food will be the best part about the holiday season is we get to be around family and friends and, and we get to have good company. And sometimes the company is with people that we really enjoy being around 
And if we're really being honest, we might say sometimes uh, we're around people, part of our family and friends and coworkers that, hey, you know, we might not normally choose to spend time around those people, but that's just part of the holidays. We enjoy sitting down. There's something special that happens when you get to sit down at a table with other people, right? And Jesus knew this to be true as well. And that's why he set up the, one of the really the most pivotal parts of his ministry while he was on the earth was to sit down and eat with people. Because he knew in those moments when we're both partaking in kind of the same activity, we're both eating the same food, we're both on an even playing field, that that is a moment where you can listen, where you can connect with people, you can ask questions, you can engage, and you can influence people and have conversations with them about who they are and what you believe and, and what God is doing in your life. And so he said, hey, I'm going to come to earth and I'm going to engage with people over food. That seems like a really good idea. Specifically, though, he decided not just to engage with people that were like him, but, but the people at that day and age that, that people saw as, as, the, as the most immoral, the most wicked, the most evil. He went to hang out with these tax collectors. And the Pharisees didn't like it. In fact, it was such a controversial uh, activity for Jesus to engage with people who the, the culture at that time would have said, these are the sinners, these are the people that no one should be spending time with. It was so controversial that the Pharisees used this to even start this process of talking about how are we going to kill Jesus? How are we going to take him out? So a couple chapters later in Luke 7, this is where Jesus says, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. Well, at that point, Jesus says, uh, he, he says, you Pharisees have accused me of being a glutton and a drunkard. And they would have known in a Jewish culture that those two words, junk, drunkard and, and glutton, they relate back to an Old Testament law in Deuteronomy 21, where if, uh, if you were a parent of a rebellious child, there was a law in the Old Testament that said you could bring your child before the high priest, and if you accused your child of being a drunkard and a glutton, you use those two words, there was an immediate and automatic punishment, and it was to be stoned to death. So I don't know if there's any parents in the room that have rebellious children. Uh, we, don't, we probably won't go as far as, uh, as, as you know, picking up a rock, um, but imagine that that was the culture and that was a society. And so they're, they're claiming, hey, Jesus is a rebellious child of this Jewish system that we've created. He's a drunken and he's a glutton. Now, of course, Jesus had not. He was, sinful. He was sinless, right? He hadn't crossed any lines there. But they were accusing him of those things to begin this process of, of trying to get Jesus taken out. Because he says, I came to eat and to drink. And specifically, he's sitting down with uh, the, the people who represent the very thing they hated the most, the Roman Empire at the time. These tax collectors who were, who were taking money from them and sending them back to Rome. But see, the, the Pharisees thought Jesus would come to overthrow the Roman government. They thought he was coming to set up this new political uh, infrastructure and that he was going to be the leader. No, he came eating and drinking with the very people that they despised the most, these Roman puppets. So this is not the Messiah. This is not the person we should be following He's a big distraction. Let's take him out. So this controversial activity of sitting down with people and eating with people is what, is what Jesus had employed, but this is what Jesus knew. It's so much easier to influence people when they've, when they've been invited to the table. In fact, I would say it's almost impossible to influence people that are not at our table, at our collective influence. I mean, it, how, how are we supposed to engage and connect with people who are not like us if we don't first invite them to the table, if we don't first have an opportunity to learn who they are, to listen to what's going on in their life and, and, and listen to why they've made the decisions they're making and to just sit there and be in that with them. But this is what I love the most. Jesus just didn't hang out with these people who are not like him. He influenced them. It was so much more than just being in their presence. So it's so ironic when we think about the, the, the only person who's ever walked the face of the planet who is sinless chose to sit down with sin, sinful people and influence them, engage with them, and change them, change their hearts so that they could go and change the world. These were the very people. Matthew in the story. Jesus was looking for someone who could be very detailed, who could be really hardworking, and, and who, who, could, who could not really care about what other people thought about him to write the very first gospel in the New Testament, to write the story of Jesus on earth. So it makes sense that he would go after a tax collector who was really good at his job to write that story. But how is he supposed to impact Matthew if he doesn't first invite him to the table? He invited these people to the table. He changed their lives and then they essentially changed the world. We're sitting here today 
because of a bunch of scoundrels were invited to the table by Jesus. And I'm so thankful that that is the way that he chose to, um, to interact with the world. So we know this to be true. We know that when we invite people to our tables, it changes, it changes who they are. So I'm going to read a couple stats. Even in modern day uh, scientific studies, we know this to be true. All right, so listen to this. Sociologist Cody Delestrate explored the most recent scientific literature for Atlantic Monthly and discovered that the single most important element, single most important element in raising kids who are drug-free, healthy, intelligent, kind human beings is frequent family dinners. All right, that's not a surprise to, to anybody, right? Frequent family dinners. The most important predictor of success for elementary age children is frequent family dinners. The primary factor in shaping vocabulary for younger children is, say it with me, frequent family dinners. One more. The key variable most associated with a lower incidence of depressive and suicidal thoughts among 11 to 18 year olds is frequent family dinners. It's powerful. And, and if, it's, if it's very specific of the fact, yes, we're sharing a meal together, maybe if, you have a, if you're a parent of a rebellious child, maybe instead of stoning them, maybe it's we try frequent family dinners. But it, it doesn't have to be over the dinner table. It doesn't have to just be food. But that's one element is the element that Jesus chose that was very, very uh, impactful. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this idea? Let's look, at, let's look at some other passages of Scripture where Jesus sat down with other people around food and see if we can start to see, see a pattern. So let's think about this. Uh, we, we looked at Luke 5 and Luke 7. Luke chapter 6 is where a crowd of people start to gather around Jesus because he's performing miracles. And it starts to get later in the day. And he says, people must be hungry. Let's feed them. And so he takes some bread and some fish and he multiplies it and he feeds 5,000 people, right? We know this story. But sometimes what we don't think about, the, the connection here, is that uh, after people eat, they, they go to sleep. They stay right there out in the fields. 5,000 people sleeping in the fields because they wanted to be close to Jesus. And at this point, he hadn't, at least as far as we know, he hadn't delivered a message. He hadn't preached to them. He was simply healing people and then he prepared a meal for them. So the disciples get up early, and Jesus get up early the next morning, and they get in a boat to get away from the crowds. They go across the Sea of Galilee. While these people wake up, and they're trying to find Jesus again, and he's not there. And so they begin searching for him, and Scripture says, in mass, this group gets together and goes across the Sea of Galilee to find him, to Capernaum. And that is where the most famous speech ever recorded in history happens, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus goes up on the Mount, he shares the Beatitudes, and he says, hey, yesterday I gave you food, I gave you bread yesterday so that I could earn the right to speak into your life in this moment and tell you, I am the bread of life. The power of that moment when he says, I'm the bread of life to a group of people that he just fed miraculously the day before with bread is lost on us today. But it made so much sense to them that he had earned the right to be heard because he shared a meal with these people. And we go on from there, we think about uh, Zacchaeus. The last time I was here, we spoke about um, Zacchaeus and his story. Most likely, scholars say he was in the room that night when when Levi, Matthew, uh, had his party. So that's why it would make sense that Jesus saw him in the tree and he knew his name, Zacchaeus. Come down, let's go eat at your house. That meal changed Zacchaeus' life forever. It changed the city of Jericho. That whole region was impacted for eternity because of that meal that Jesus had with someone that no one else would want to spend time with. We keep going on from there. Let's think about the Last Supper. Okay, if you're Jesus and you're, you're trying to capture these, these people who are not like you, these fishermen, these tax collectors, these doctors, and you're trying to mobilize them to launch the biggest movement ever in history, you would think that you might um, put together a presentation or some kind of diagram and let's put three points on the wall and explain why and how you're supposed to communicate the gospel to the rest of the world. But he didn't do that. He invited them to a table. He washed their feet and they broke bread together and he said, I'm about to die and then I'll come back to life and I'll live forever in your hearts, and then one day you'll join me in heaven. That's how he shared the gospel with the 12 people who would then change the world. Not in a diagram, not in a speech, not in a lecture. It was over food. And we go from there. Even think about uh, the guys who were on the road to Emmaus. After Jesus has already been crucified and he, and, he, and he goes to heaven, he appears and he walks on this road with these two guys from Emmaus, and he walks back to their home. And they're discussing the events of the weekend, Scholars say that these two guys, because they had the ability to kind of leave their work for a few days, they probably were landowners, most likely business people. And then in that moment, when they finally get to the house and they sit down to eat, what happens? 
They break bread together, and in that moment, they recognized who he was. This is Jesus. This is the Son of God. This is the guy who we just were, were talking about. Jesus disappears in that moment. And they said, didn't our hearts burn within us? Yeah, because they were sitting down with Jesus. They were sitting down with this man that they had been talking about. And in that moment, they began to go out and share the word that they had seen him. They were some of the first people that said, hey, we saw the risen Lord. He reappeared to us, and it's real. It's true. We can believe it. The holy heartburn that they felt in that moment because they, were, they, were, they, they had experienced something from Jesus is pretty special. The last meal that we have recorded in Scripture that Jesus had was the moment he had reappeared to the disciples. So uh, they were on the Sea of Galilee. They went back to fishing, the thing that they knew. And Jesus is on the, on the shore. And they see Jesus, and they're afraid at first, and eventually they realize it's him. And they come on shore, and Jesus had prepared, prepared a breakfast for them. So he cooked fish. Maybe there were some grits and eggs there as well, but he had some fish for breakfast. And he fed the disciples, and that's the moment where he takes Peter aside. And he says, Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Powerful conversations had around food. Set up those moments set up by these opportunities to break bread and, and share with people. So what do we do with all this? I mean, you, you will, as every time that you read stories in Scripture now and you see that food element there, you're going to notice that, that there's something powerful happening. But what do we as a church do with that? How do we invite people who are not like us to the table? So I think that there is some, some prescriptive uh, things that we can follow in Scripture. So we're going we're to look really quickly at Hebrews chapter 13, um, where it says, you should have a potluck every Sunday. That's the way that you incorporate food into uh, your ministry. Anybody okay with that? A potluck every Sunday? All the men say yes, all the women say no. All right. Hebrews chapter 13. So um, more than likely Luke was the author of Hebrews. So one of these 12 men that Jesus influenced that was not really like him. But he spent time with him, and, and the author of Hebrews is really anonymous, uh, but, but there's, many, there's much evidence that say Luke was probably the guy who wrote this book. Uh, he's speaking to the Jewish audience here of people who have now started following Christ, Hebrews 13, and this is the last chapter. So it's basically the summation of the book and saying, hey, here's, here's how we should be like Christ. And the first two verses are very simply, it says this, let brotherly love continue, do not, let me read the NIV. Uh, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. So if I can kind of, uh, kind of speak into this passage a little bit, I think here the prescription for, for us uh, in this day and age, how do we influence people that are not like us? I think first it has to start with us individually. First we have to love ourselves. First, we have to commit to following the Lord, following the Word, staying in the Word, uh, staying in prayer, uh, and, and first really leading ourselves to the, to the throne every single day to the feet of Jesus. We can't influence other people and invite them to the table if we're not first being influenced by the Lord. So thankfully, He's invited us all to His table, right? And we get to sit at His feet every single day and stay in the Word and stay in prayer. First, we have to be influenced by the Lord ourselves. And then as we do that, it spills out into this community, to the church. That's loving one another as brothers and sisters, right? Caring for each other, walking with each other, walking and caring for our burdens with each other. There are so many people in this room today that are hurting, that are in a painful place physically, emotionally, mentally, that are battling some things that, unfortunately, as the church, we don't even know about. But that's what God's called us to as a body of believers. How are we going to influence the world out there if we're not first connecting with each other, holding each other accountable to what God has called us to. This is a place where we should be fully known by each other and your struggles can be carried by your brothers and sisters. So first we have to love each other. And we can't just gloss over that because that's a big thing and we could spend weeks talking about just that issue itself. And hopefully that really is the case. But then beyond that, how do we go out and love the people that are strangers? This, the verse in Hebrew, Hebrews literally says, don't neglect to love the strangers. The people that are not like you. The people that often don't get welcomed to your table. So the, the, uh, the definition that was just on the screen, this is from, uh, this is from a, a, a scholar named Henry Nouwen. He, he wrote a lot about the Holy Spirit. Uh, lived many years ago, but uh, someone that I, I really, I, I read a lot. And 
he put forward this definition of the church. He said the church should be an open and hospitable place where strangers can cast off their strangeness and become our fellow human beings. That sounds like a pretty, that's a, that's a place I want to be. I think that's a place where all of us want to be. That our strangeness has been cast off and we just connect because we're human beings. And we can connect over uh, who we are and who God has made us to be. So I don't know about you, but most often this doesn't seem to be the case for the church. When we look at the churches in this nation and around the world, and even if we look at our church specifically, is this true of our church? Is this a place where strangers are invited in and we can connect with them just because they're human beings? I really think that God's calling us in Scripture based on the things that Jesus did. It's a little uncomfortable for us, but I think what Jesus is calling us to is to be a place that's, that invites anyone to our table. And so we look out and we say, hey, if you, if you are living a homosexual lifestyle, there's a seat for you at my table. That's hard to say. In this community, that's hard to say. That doesn't, get, that doesn't happen very often. It feels uncomfortable, right? If you, if you are a Democrat, you're invited to my table. Let's have a conversation. Let's, let's listen to each other. Not so we can have a food fight, but so we can know each other. We can understand where we're coming from. If you're an illegal immigrant, you have a seat at my table. If you are an ex-con, you have a seat at my table. If you're a prostitute, if you're selling drugs, you have a seat at my table. We don't, there may not be some obvious things we have in common, but when we get to connect with each other, we recognize we're both made in the image of God and that we're both human beings and we've both walked this earth together and faced some of the same challenges. Just different decisions have been made and there's a different outcome. But we're a lot more alike than we are different. Right? Yeah. So what does that look like for us to invite people who are not like us to our table? Well, I know on, on Tuesday and really the rest of this week, there's a great opportunity for, for that. Wednesday morning, we'll wake up and... Most likely, half of our state will be upset and half of our state will be happy to some extent. Uh, across the country, the same is true, right? Roughly half of our country is going to be happy about the, whatever the results are Tuesday and half will be upset. But we have experienced too much grace in our life to allow the political issues of our day to keep us from inviting people to the table. We are better than that, church. We cannot allow divisive issues that the enemy is trying to do to polarize us and make us feel like we have nothing in common to keep us from being able to have influence over the people in our lives. So if you're pro-choice, please come to my table. Let's have a conversation. Let's, let's welcome individuals in who are not like us and see how God uses those moments to, to influence, to change, to impact. That's where we, that's where we are called to be. That's what God is calling us to as a church. So let's look at, at one other passage because I think if, if, we, if we recognize this, we have to still have this motivation. Why does it matter? Why are we going to such great lengths? Because these moments for many of us could be awkward. If someone's not like you and you're committing to spend time with that person uh, or to engage with that person meaningfully, that can be challenging. That can be awkward. That can be uncomfortable. Why, what is the motivation for us to push through and, and do those things I think we have to remember um, that we've walked in the same shoes. Um, and so let's look at this final passage. This is Ephesians 2.12. Ephesians 2.12. So it's up on the screen here. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I'm going to read that one more time and see if anybody is awake out there. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That is, that is the gospel. We've all been there. We all were strangers to God. We are all strangers to His grace. We were far off. And even today in this room, there are people who feel like, man, I just feel like I'm far from God. And God says, come to the table. And, and, and God is saying that to us. We, we've been far off. And God has brought us near through the blood of Jesus Christ. So who are we to keep that from anybody else that doesn't seem to look or act or talk like us? So for me, when I read this passage, um, and let's connect it to this final verse I'll read, verse 19. 
So skipping down a few more verses, verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You're no longer strangers, but you are a citizen of heaven. That's powerful. We have to stand on the, the promises of scripture um, that, we are all, that we are all one body. So for me, I don't have any other option but to read these passages and say there's really three options for us as a church. That we have three options that, of places we could stand on this whole dynamic, this whole concept. There's three options. So maybe the first option is we stand over here and we say, we will only welcome people to the table who are like us. That's where we're comfortable. Uh, that's where we can all get along. There's not going to be any awkwardness here. And I'll live out my days in a place where I can just be around the people who are exactly like me. That seems to be the, the path the Pharisees had taken throughout Scripture. We will all come together and we'll all act like we're really good and that we have everything together. But in reality, there's all this sin that's under the surface that no one's going to address, no one's going to talk about, but we'll just act like we've got everything figured out and that we're following the law to a T. And if anybody tries to rock the boat, we'll cast them out. That's the church that says, hey, we only want people here who are like us. And let's be honest, there's lots of them in this city. There's lots of those churches around the world, and, and, and there's a huge problem with that. So are we going to be a church that says, hey, we only want people to be here who are like us? Option two would be a church that says, hey, we want to be welcoming. We want to invite anyone to the table who's not like us. Let's bring all those people who are, who are strangers to, a, to an extent to us. Let's bring them to the table. And we're just going to hang out with them. We're just going to be happy to sit in their presence. And in fact, we're going to justify Scripture to match the, the needs of this society. We're going to change the things that we believe and hold dear that have been true for centuries because our God does not change. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. Yet Hebrews 13 is where that's found. Uh, we're going to change what's true, what we know to be true about God and about Scripture to match the desires of society, to make these people feel a little bit better, to make them feel a little more comfortable. That's not what God's calling us to. That's not, the, that's not what we see in, in Scripture. Jesus influenced these people by being in their presence and connecting with them, but it wasn't just to hang out. It was to be this third option, a church that says, hey, anyone's welcome at our table. We want to go and engage and listen and, 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 and be in these conversations and learn things that are about people that are not like us so that we can earn the right to speak into their lives, so that we can influence, so that we can just sit there and listen. And if something happens in their life where things don't go the way they plan, we're there. We're a shoulder to cry on that we are the church. That's what God's called us to. And that's, the, that's God's only option, right? Are we willing to step into the awkwardness and the uncomfortability to be that kind of church? I hope so. I absolutely hope that's where God is, is calling us as a community. So what does it look like practically for the people in this room to do that? I know there are a lot of people in the room that just say, hey, I, I feel far from God today. If that's you, these altars are open. God's inviting you to come to sit down next to him at his table. Sit down and be set free. That's what the song says, right? God's calling you. And as we pray in just a few minutes, this altar's open for you. But for a lot of people in the room, you're saying, hey, how do I influence people? If you're in middle school or high school or college, how do you influence people in your classroom? Can you take a project alongside someone that you normally would not hang out with? Probably someone that maybe no one in the room wants to partner with. And just get to know that person and do a project together. And even take on the ridicule from your friends because you're hanging out with those people. If you're an adult in the room... It may physically be inviting someone over for dinner. That seems to be a great model. Jesus showed us that. But there, there's lots of ways that we can connect with people that we work with, people that are in our family and friends that just, that you know, uh, that just need to hear the truth or just need to be listened to, just need to be cared for, just need to be served. So how, how does that, what does that look like for you? If the Holy Spirit is prompting you in different ways, then, then, then run with that. Share it with somebody else today so that they can hold you accountable to that. It may be inviting someone over for dinner. It may be meeting someone at lunch. It may be uh, just having somebody over to watch the game, tailgate together. Do something that, um, that you can enjoy, that you can get to know each other through, and then see how God leads you in those moments. I think it, it, very practically, very simply, it could just be as simple as, hey, when you sit down to a meal, we, we, we normally kind of think that we're going to pray over that meal. 
But you may be with people that that's not normal and that's not common. And if we're an option to church, then we're just going to say, hey, I'm not going to pray because that's going to make this moment a little bit uncomfortable. But the, the people of this church over here say, I'm going to pray. And actually, as we pray over this food, I just believe that God hears our prayers. Is there anything that, that you need or your family needs that, that we can just pray for in this moment? Whatever is the response to that question can change your relationship with that individual forever. I mean, the same can be true of you just, you know, you, 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 you're you hanging out with someone. Maybe you're not having a meal. But at the end of that time, hey, I've enjoyed hanging out with you. Thanks for connecting. And Is there anything? I just, I, I believe in prayer. Is there anything that your family needs that, that, that I can just be praying and asking God for? You may pray in that moment. Maybe, maybe you don't. Maybe you pray for them later. But if, but as God answers that prayer, they say, my daughter's sick, or I need money to, to pay bills this month, or I've got to get my grades up, or whatever it is. You pray for them, and God answers that prayer. It's a wide open door now to share the gospel. And I get to see this often in, in our lives as we work with refugees. We ask that prayer all the time. Is there anything you or your family need that we can pray and ask God to help you with? And I'm, I should not be, but I'm often surprised at how God meets that exact prayer when we pray for it. And it is just a wide open door to share the gospel. So God is moving around the world in, in incredible ways because of that question. How can we pray for you? It's a very simple tool that practically we can use in our life. So God has come, Jesus came to us, coming to eat and to drink and to sit down and engage and influence us. And I hope that is the model that we take on as a church as well. So I'm going to pray for us and then, and then we're dismissed. The altar is open for you. Um, if you just want to come to the table, the altar is open for those who feel um, like God is speaking to them. How can, you, uh, how can you influence those in your life? How can you share that with the people around you? Um, we need the accountability from this church to make this happen. You could say, hey, I've been praying for a couple years for John that I work with, and I have an opportunity to go eat, eat lunch with him next week. Would you just be praying for me that I'll just be able to listen? To what prayer needs he might have or would you just pray for me that I'll be bold enough to say whatever God puts in my heart to say to him in that moment we have to do that as a body all right let's pray God we're grateful that you have invited us to the table God that you made a way for us those who are sinners those who are sick God that you did not come for the righteous but for sinners to find repentance and God we count ourselves as one who was so far off but has been brought near by the blood of Christ as, as one who were not citizens but we were strangers but now God you have, have made us whole and God it's because that we, we have so much in common with those that we look around and say are not like us uh, that God we are motivated to invite them in to listen to them to ask questions and as you lead us God to discern what is the right thing to say in the right moment. God, we know that you'll give us that, that wisdom. God, I pray that you give us boldness to take action, to not be a church that just listens but, but doesn't do anything, but God, that is a church that welcomes anyone in our network, in our life, to the table, to our table. And then we can step up and specifically be here calling us to be in those relationships. God, I pray you continue to give just favor over this church, God. Give us a peace that passes all understanding, a joy that is unspeakable so that we can truly connect with the community around us. And God, we love in your name. Amen.